Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel and have I got some exciting news for you because in the past week the GRVA has actually approved the first iteration of the DCAS regulations. So that means that finally we will be able to get FSD beta coming outside of North America to all those countries that are under the UNECE regulations. Now there were a few acronyms in that introduction so let me start with what those actually are. So DCAS means that it's a driver control assistance system. And that means that it assists the driver, but does not completely take over the driving task. Thus, the responsibility remains with the driver. And even if the DCAS system uh, is performing typically tasks associated with level three to level five, only ADS or autonomous driving systems may permit the driver from disengaging from the driving task. So that means that you as a driver are always responsible for the behavior of the car and you need to be able to intervene at any and all times. So that is basically the definition of a level two system. It is an assistance system and it is not full self drive as the name somewhat suggests to some. Now that brings us to the topic of driver responsibilities. And that means in the new regulations, they actually mentioned that uh, the safe use of the system, the DCAS system or FSD beta in case of um, Tesla, it requires appropriate understanding by the driver. So it is you as the driver who is responsible for knowing what the system can and cannot do. And of course, Tesla needs to provide some education on that. So probably they will have some videos on that in the car and you need to watch them before you can enable FSD beta, for example. A second topic there is that every single system, every single DCAS system out there must function in roughly the same way because you will switch cars or when you rent a car, you need to know and understand how the system actually works. So they will actually move in some distant future to an ISO certification for the DCAS system. So to make sure that they all function in the same way. Now, from Tesla's point of view, there needs to be a balanced marketing policy as well as to not cause overestimation of the capabilities of the system. So most likely the FSD name will have to be changed. Maybe you can just call it not FSD or the full buy yourself drive instead of full self drive. I don't know what Tesla is going to do with that. Probably something funny to circumvent the regulations, but yeah, they cannot market it as being a self-driving car when it is clearly not yet a self-driving car. Now, when we look at the specifications, the system may activate relevant vehicle systems when necessary and applicable. So it can activate the wipers, the heating system, of course, but also the direction indicators or the blinkers. So that means that there will be system initiated maneuvers. So that is, that is cool because we haven't had that so far. It was always driver initiated. The system shall also have the capability to adapt the vehicle speed in response to road curvature, which is something that Tesla has become better at, but still the speed limits and reading the speed limits, that is not good. Reading it in terms of road curvature uh, has gotten better, but there are still some cases where it's going into the curve too fast and then it starts freaking out because it cannot exceed that lateral 0.3 Gs of acceleration in that curve. Now it is recognized that the maximum lateral acceleration values specified by the vehicle manufacturer may not be achievable under all conditions. So if there's snow, ice uh, on the road, for example, different tires uh, fitted to the car or uh, laterally sloped roads that are banked in the wrong direction, um, that is something that could cause potentially dangerous situations when you always apply the maximum lateral acceleration. So there has to be a system that can actually detect the level of grip that a car has or will have in an upcoming bend and then adjust the speed according to that. Um, curious to see how different manufacturers will actually work with that system. As for maneuvers, so they can be system initiated, but every single maneuver needs to be driver confirmed. So that is something that's a little bit different from what the US has, but 
the thing is that they don't say how it needs to be confirmed. So it could be that glancing towards the mirror is enough to confirm the actual maneuver. And that would be awesome. Then it, we move towards more an eyes-on system than a hands-on system. But I'll come back to that in a little bit. Now, either the person is engaged and then it will execute the maneuver, or if it's disengaged, and uh, there are several methods where it will be detected what the disengagement actually is. I'll come back to that in a minute as well. But then the maneuver shall not be completed. It's also not aimed to complete or to propose a maneuver that would violate applicable instruction by relevant signage or other traffic rules. So it will obey the law and it should, of course, but there will be some cases where that will be really hard and then it's interesting to see what the car will actually do so for example if you have a, a one lane where you cannot cross a solid white line then a car is parked in that lane you need to go around it will the car actually go around it or will you have to take over and do the maneuver manually because it would be breaking the law for crossing that uh, solid white line so again, curious to see what the actual implementation will be and what the car will actually do at that point. Now, what if the driver is unavailable? So the system is equipped with a driver confirmed or system initiated lane change feature, then is actually allowed to go to the side of the road. Currently, if the driver is unavailable due to some reason, can be inattentive, or it can also be that the driver has had a heart attack. The car will actually start slowing down in the same lane, put on the four blinkers, and that's basically it. And it will come to a full stop. When the car will actually be able to do a system initiated lane change, then it can move over to a slower lane or it can move over to the uh, emergency lane and stop there, which is a much safer solution, of course. And I really like that they are actually planning it that way. Now, as for speed limits, we all know that Tesla is horrible in terms of speed limits, so they do have a lot of work to do uh, on that level. Now, what has happened in the past couple of months is that Tesla has gotten really good at reading the speed limits, but they are not always applied correctly when you're using autopilot. Fine example is here in my area. I encountered a speed sign of 50 on a road where I can do 70 before that, and if I don't have autopilot engaged, it will go down to 50. And if I then engage autopilot, I cannot go over 50. So that's good. But if I'm already on autopilot at 70, then it will not go down to 50 until about three, 400 meters beyond that sign. So that would be actually giving me speeding tickets. Um, so there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on that level. Of course, we have to keep in mind that what we are currently driving here in Europe is basically a five-year-old software stack. And if we get FSD beta version 12 from the start, for example, things will be completely different. And hopefully those things will be fixed in there. But it is kind of um, worrying because especially in Belgium, we have changing speed limits like every couple of hundred meters. Uh, we do have a change in the speed limit and the fact that the car does not adapt to it properly, usually that is a big deal. And for FSD beta, that will be even a bigger deal to do that. So the system shall not exceed the maximum speed limit in the country where it's at. So in Belgium, for example, the system will not work above 120 kilometers an hour. The question is, what does that mean for Germany? Do they go all the way up to 140 kilometers an hour or do they stick to the recommended 130 kilometers an hour? We'll have to see. Currently, Autopilot is able to go to up, up to um, 140 kilometers an hour. It used to be 150. In the later cars, it's been brought down to 140. Also, something important here is that in case where there is a change in the system determined road speed limit, the driver shall be given at least an acoustic or haptic signal, which I think would be extremely annoying. But luckily, they say it may be suppressed permanently by the driver, especially in Belgium. As I said, with ever changing speed limits, it would buzz away uh, the whole time. And I don't think anybody would use the system anymore. 
Now for driver confirmed maneuvers, the system shall visually inform the driver about the proposed maneuver. If it's a combination of maneuvers, it needs to make that clear as well. And it needs to make that clear at least three seconds ahead of the actual maneuver, except of course for emergency maneuvers that the system can also take. If we then go to the disengagement monitoring of the driver, well, the system shall monitor the driver is motorically and visually disengaged. So it is hands-on and eyes-on. So forget about taping off the camera at that point. It is actually mandatory that the camera will have to see your attentiveness. And it can look at the eye gaze, it can look at the head position. If your head is down, you're potentially looking at a cell phone, but at least you're not paying attention to that. And the checking intervals are actually going to become smaller and smaller as well. So that is also an important one and something that I'm not really looking forward to. So the driver shall also be deemed to be re-engaged if the head position and the eye position is back towards the driving task for at least 200 milliseconds. Now, the reason why I put this in here is to show you guys that this is actually the level at which the UNECE determines every single bit in that regulation. And that is why it takes so long because they want to specify, they did some research, like how long does it take to be re-engaged in a certain task? And they did some studies about that and they came to the conclusion, well, we'll it has to be 200 milliseconds before we can say, okay, this person is engaged again. Now it's two tenths of a second. It's not that long, but still, if you do this, going from one end, from the side mirror to there to there, it is going to be uh, not enough and you will get warnings. So have to keep your head straight ahead. Now the hands-on request. At speeds above 10 kilometers per hour, the hands-on request shall be given, uh, which is the same as it is now. Up until 10 kilometers an hour, you can drive kind of hands-free uh, in a traffic jam. But as soon as you hit 10 kilometers an hour, you get that warning that you need to hold the steering wheel. Now, Currently, we have a nag every 15 seconds. That is going to go down to five seconds. That's also a big change that is coming. However, it may be delayed for a period of up to five seconds. So 10 seconds uh, is the maximum. It's still less than 15 seconds if the driver is visually engaged. In the event of continued disengagement, the hands-on request shall be escalated latest 10 seconds after the initial uh, hands-on request. Right now you have 15 seconds and after another 15 seconds it actually starts beeping at you and after one minute it will actually give you a forced disengagement. Here is going to be a maximum of 20 seconds before it starts beeping at you. So that's also going to be uh, reduced. The eyes-on request, remember it's hands-on and eyes-on, the eyes on request is also above 10 kilometers an hour, but shall be given again after five seconds. If you don't pay attention at that point, it only takes three seconds later before it starts escalating. So it's already after eight seconds that it starts escalating um, the, the errors uh, with acoustic and haptic information. And at the latest five seconds following an escalation, so after 13 seconds, a DCA, a direct control alert, shall be presented to the driver. So that's the takeover immediately and autopilot is cancelling the forceful disengagement already after 13 seconds. That is a lot quicker. As I said, now it's one minute. It will become 13 seconds, uh, the maximum. So... They are doing this to make sure that you are really, really, really paying attention to the road. And on the one hand, I think this is actually a good thing because, well, if a car is going to be semi-autonomous in city streets, right? This is a new thing that is coming to Europe, right? Um, if that is going to cause an accident, it will be all over the news and the whole regulation will be set back for many years because there is so much scrutiny on this topic that I don't think it's logical anymore. But 
I understand it from that perspective. You have to be attentive at any and all times. And on the highway, well, there are not that much variables on a highway. So that makes it a little bit easier. But uh, on the other hand, in city streets, there are so many variables there. A kid running into the street, some guy jaywalking. Uh, you won't see that on a highway, right? So the situation is a lot more complex and therefore they want to make sure that you will be alert and paying attention at any and all times. Now there are some additional DCAS specifications. So the feature may be permitted to induce higher lateral accelerations than uh, 0.3 Gs in curves, for example, in order not to disturb traffic flow. So that is something that is good. So they are providing exceptions in certain cases. It's not going to be what is actually going to happen constantly. But if the car misjudged somehow, it is more important to keep the car in the lane than stick to the 0.3 G's lateral acceleration limit. Also merging traffic. Um, so if a lane ends, it will have to merge into the other lane or some other cars need to merge into your lane. Now, that is just a lane change that is going to happen, but it will have to take into account that the lane will end in a certain distance. So it has to know where the lane is ending and it has to be able to adjust its position to make a safe lane change in that case. As for lane keeping, the system needs to provide visual information to the driver of the upcoming driving situation or the maneuver that it's doing. Tesla is currently doing that already. The system adapts the vehicle speed to upcoming changes in road curvature. We mentioned that before, so it needs to adjust to an upcoming curvature and not saying, oh, this was too fast and then slow down and panic a little bit. Um, so the system needs to know that. And the system also needs to make sure that the driver is engaged by confirming the driver's visual attention during maneuver. And last but not least, the system may allow for the driver to perform minor lateral corrections. Um, for example, to avoid a pothole. You can already do that now as well, but there is of course a fine line be between being able to make a small correction and actually disengaging the autopilot or the FSD in this case. So we'll have to make sure that where is that line? You won't be able to just make a quick maneuver around the pothole, but you will be able to, if you see it upcoming or if you know that the pothole is there, uh, gradually up front, steer a little bit away from that pothole. The virtual rescue lane. So this is a specific European thing. We also call it the Rettungsgasse because Germany was the first country to actually start that. Right now, there are like seven or eight countries, I believe, that have this system in place where it is mandatory if you're in a traffic jam that the leftmost lane goes to the left and the rightmost lane or the if it's a two lane or the middle lane if it's if it's a three lane road needs to move to the right so you create a virtual lane in between those where emergency vehicles can continue to drive to reach the accident or the emergency whatever it may be a lot faster thus saving vital seconds and minutes even to be faster on scene and potentially saving lives of course and of course, when the traffic jam uh, is resolved and traffic starts moving again, you need to move into the right center line of the lane. Right now, the autopilot cannot do that here in Europe. So that means that autopilot in Europe is basically useless in a lot of countries when you're in a traffic jam. The situation where it would be the most useful, it is actually, you can't use it anymore because it does not do this virtual rescue lane. As for the auto lane change, um, a lane change can be initiated by the driver or the system so long as the driver is given sufficient notice to react. So it needs to be informed up front. Uh, as I said before, at least three seconds up front. What is really nice here is that the system shall be permitted to assist the driver in changing lanes on roads where pedestrians and cyclists are not prohibited and that are by design not equipped with a physical separation of traffic moving in the opposite direction. So that means local roads. Right now we only have highways and major roads where there are no cyclists, no pedestrians allowed and with a physical divider between the driving directions. 
with this regulation, it can basically do an auto lane change wherever it possibly can. And of course, a lane change shall not be performed towards a lane intended for traffic moving in the opposite direction. That could be kind of a pickle here, because, well, if you're in a city street and somebody is parked there, there are one way or one lane uh, for each direction. You cannot pass that car. But again, it does allow for passing slower vehicles uh, as well. So we'll have to see what this means in reality. Now the five second rule has been extended to seven seconds. Now if you remember, the five second rule was actually this, the driver initiates a lane change, the car cannot move for the first second, and then after that it can start moving, but between three and five seconds, it needs to cross the lane markings with the front wheel. Those five seconds have now become seven seconds. It's not that much, but, Sometimes it actually makes a difference. Now, where can the auto lane change be used? So the regulations, they specifically speak of leading the vehicle to select a lane. So selecting a turning lane, for example, entering or exiting a roundabout, driving around a parked vehicle on the side of the road. But again, if there's like a two lane thing, um, I don't know how it will actually work uh, because you may have to cross into the oncoming lane and the previous text actually said that that is not allowed. So we'll have to see and I'll have to test that in different situations when we get it here. Uh, it can also lead to take a turn specifically. So intersections, taking turns, um, that's perfectly possible. Lead the vehicle to depart or arrive at a parked position. So it can automatically go out of a parked position or into a parked position, entering or ex exiting the motorway, changing lanes in an environment where traffic may be dense. So urban driving, definitely. And there are some exceptions there as to the gaps that are required. Uh, you're also driving slower, so the gaps need to be slower anyway, because the formula for using or for calculating those gaps also take the speed into account. Now, what were the decisions of the January meeting? For now, only hands-on and eyes-on. So both will be required. The hands-off DCAS um, is being discussed, they are working on it, but for now, it is provisionally foreseen for September. That would remove the hands-on nag when remaining visually engaged. So that is what we are all hoping for, that we can just remain visually engaged and visually engaged also means that if you have a maneuver that's initiated, you can look into the mirror. So that will still be engaged because that will be a confirmation that you have looked in the mirror and it can actually confirm that suggested maneuver or in the other mirror, of course. Um, and the hands-off system will actually cascade to the uh, hands-on system where uh, the eyes on is not available or the driver is not visually engaged. And again, then it will be that five second rule that is going to be applied there. So what are the next steps now? Well, the next step is going to be that the DCAS is now approved by the GRVA and it has to go to the WP29 meeting. The next meeting is in March. It's very unlikely to be discussed there due to the fact that the documents must be submitted way in advance. So that is something that we have to take into account. It might be possible, we might be pleasantly surprised, but all my sources tell me do not take into account that it will be March, do not rely on that. It will be on the next meeting, which will be in June. Now, when the GRVA has accepted a proposal, and has voted on that proposal, the WP29 meeting is usually just a formality. So we can be 99.9% .9 certain that FSD beta will come to Europe and the rest of the UNECE countries by January 2025, because if it's accepted by WP29 in June, it will go into effect in January the year after that. Now, of course, all manufacturers that want to bring this feature have to go through rigorous testing first. So there is an approval process that Tesla will have to go through and they still have some things to change, like the virtual rescue lane, like the speed limit detection and all those kinds of things. They need to make sure that this is working perfectly before they go through the approval process. 
Now remember when I said that the hands-off ISON system was going to be provisionally foreseen for September? Well, if the September meeting actually approves that, and I doubt that that will happen, but assume that they actually approve it at that point already, then there's still only a very slight chance that it will already be in the January release. Uh, then it will have to go to the WP29 meeting in November. And we have seen that that is really tight window to, uh, to make that happen. So yeah, there, uh, there you have it. So this is the conclusion that we can take. We have a big step in the right direction towards FSD beta. It's still not 100% the same as what is running in the US, but I have a feeling that the US is going to be more stricter. We are going to be less stricter because of the regulations and we will meet somewhere in the middle where everything will kind of run the same because in the US they have the system of better to ask forgiveness than permission. And here you need permission for everything. And we are seeing that the NHTSA is already taking back some of the freedoms that uh, you have in the US with autopilot and FSD. Um, and it becomes more and more strict to make sure that that system is actually used as an actual level two system. So that is why with the DCAS regulations, the driver monitoring is very, very strict to make sure that the driver is engaged at all times, to make sure that you know what a level two system is and that it is a level two system and just nothing more than that. And of course, to minimize the risks of accidents. I certainly hope to be in the first batch of beta testers. And when it happens, I will definitely start testing FSD beta again here on our European roads. And for sure, once it's uh, good enough, I will definitely take it on the magic roundabout in Swindon to just see how that will actually happen. For now, I'd like to thank you for your attention and your continued support and uh, see you guys in the next one. Bye bye.